So welcome to this kind of second uh, installment of Conscious Collectives and Deliberately Developmental Spaces. I'm joined again by my colleague, uh, Carl Steyert, uh, from the Cultural Catalyst Network. And today we're going to talk again in about the kind of what, why, and how of conscious collectives and deliberately rental spaces and explore kind of a variety of questions as they come up as we chat. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, Carl. It's uh, a pleasure. Thanks, Rufus. So I wanted to start, you know, this term conscious collectives or conscious co-living or deliberately developmental spaces that we're using the more technical term. You know, we have a intentionally you don't have a really precise definition. Um, and people do ask us, like, what it is. So I wanted to talk with you, Carl, first of all, about, you know, what, what do we mean by that term? You know, you, you've obviously been kind of, in a way, working in this kind of area for many years. What, what do you see it meaning, roughly? Well, I'll, I'll name the, the terms that I've been using and how I think about defining them. And I think they correlate quite a bit with the terms that you're using. So for a number of years, I've been using the term uh, transformational learning communities. And by that, I mean both short term. So it could be even something for a week or a few weeks, anywhere up to months or years. It could be a permanent long term residential community. But I've been using this term of transformational learning community because I see it as a group of people for whatever length of time coming together with an intention to learn, but also in a way that transforms us, that changes us. And and I've over time come up with sort of three dimensions of that, which to me expand beyond what a lot of intentional communities are at least explicitly perhaps focusing on as to the same degree. And those are to thrive, which I think a lot of communities are aiming for, like how do we live well? But then beyond that is to evolve. So how do we develop as people become more whole, become more competent, become more wise in various ways. And then third is to serve. How can we also then be of benefit to people beyond our immediate sphere or beyond our own immediate community? So that thriving, evolving, serving, to me, are those are dimensions that I find particularly exciting about a transformational community, or you could call it a conscious community. And I think that correlates with what you're talking about and goes beyond simply living well in community. Absolutely. I mean, I think for me, when it's all kind of conscious co-living or conscious collectives, the broader term, or deliberately developmental space is the really technical one. You've kind of hit the nail on the head that it's the emphasis on that first, the conscious. So, I mean, obviously, this aspect of living together, which, you know, I think that's just to, to say something, the co-living or the collectives. Um, but this aspect of a focus on conscious inner development, conscious kind of praxis, developmental praxis in personally and collectively, that's central. And I do want to just draw on something then to ask you, you know, we could just discuss a little bit. Is obviously, um, th this is uh, maybe either a, a specific kind or a, a, I wouldn't say a new term for something that exists, but a kind of specific, a specification of something there. So, we, you know, what kind of things that already look like this that people might be familiar with? Well, there's intentional communities or echo villages. Um, even the term echo village is a good example of, you know, a subgroup of uh, intentional communities that focused on, you know, ecology or those kind of practices. You might say conscious communities or conscious intentional communities or conscious collectives are focusing on that inner development. What are, what other things do you think people might be kind of familiar with that are close to or you know, not exactly the same, but which are you know you could that relate to the conscious co-living examples that people might might know of already and that would be familiar as terms or ideas? Yeah. <clears throat> well, as you know, one of the you know, long-standing examples would be monasteries, right? I mean, so monasteries or other religious communities and, and a lot of intentional communities over the eons have been spiritual or religious communities. So I think that's an example. I, I think it is important to say that not all conscious communities need to be religious or spiritual, and they certainly don't need to have just one tradition or one belief system. In fact, I think some of the most exciting are really pluralistic or have multiple different practices and belief systems. And I think that's something we could look at is how sort of singular versus pluralistic sort of the worldview of these communities are. Uh, but that's that's an, a notable example that's out there. And I think 
I think as you were pointing out about eco villages, and I would say, you know, eco villages, as I understand the definition, really does intend to be both a learning and a service minded type of community. I think maybe what you and I both and people who are in this conversation are excited about with conscious co-living or conscious communities is perhaps even more emphasis on this developmental aspect. Because what I found in, in many eco-villages is that there is there is this attention on ecological living, which I think is crucial and so needed on the planet. And I think that we need an equal, if not even greater attention on ensuring that we're really growing up and maturing and developing more individual and collective wisdom and competency and coherence uh, in order to serve the ecological and social uh, aims that we have for the wider society. I think that's, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think to, to build on that, there's um, a couple of points, which is that, so first of all, you know, this conscious co-living term, you might say, you know, you can think of monasteries and this is conscious co-living is, is ref but that's kind of like the strongest end, you know, of what you might think of as conscious co-living, but it is one real example where clearly uh, Buddhist, monastic, Christian monastic, others have this really um, well, explicit focus on on some kind of uh, spiritual development or evolution, you might say. Uh, so they're one real example. I think the other example thing to come to, you mentioned about intentional communities that or eco-villages is, you know, your, ex your experience is definitely more expensive, extensive than mine. But there's a sense which they always often end up, if they are to function, actually having uh, a, some kind of focus on kind of what we call the conscious part, the, the inner development. But often it's maybe some way accidental. It becomes necessary for the functioning of the group to to find these, you know, to find these practices. But it isn't like a core reason in the same way that, for example, monastic, you know, spiritual monastic traditions have. Though sometimes it is, it really, it really varies. But I'm saying that as a kind of, as you say, it's often the focus is on the ecological part, which is so crucial. But uh, in the conscious collectives, it's, again, you might have an ecological dimension, but there's a kind of central focus or consciousness about the conscious uh, work. So that's the kind of what, um, do you want to talk a bit more why? Why is it the conscious kind of communities or this idea of deliberately learning to space is kind of coming up more uh, now, you know, I mean, maybe it's always been there. We're just giving examples of things that have been there for millennia, but particularly in this kind of broader, more polaristic, more, I don't want to say secular, but more mainstream version. Why is that arising now, do you think? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question that I think is being asked and answered by a number of people. I mean, I think particularly some examples that come to mind is John Verveke, who is, you know, quite popular in a lot of circles, uh, looking at metamodernism and his whole exploration of awakening to the meaning crisis. It, it, what, what I understand him to be saying, and he's saying quite a few things based on a really rich exploration of psychology and, and philosophy, but and and human history, but this this recognition that that we are perhaps experiencing a time of crisis in meaning, given sort of what's happened with modernism and capitalism, and so where we're where we are, and, and dealing with things like artificial intelligence, where a lot of people are struggling with depression, with a sense of alienation from a sense of place, a sense of fear about the future of the planet, you know, eco economic as well as political destabilization. And I think with all of those challenges happening, I do think that these are all fueling a sense of, wait, how are we living? And, and is this highly hyper-individualistic um, sort of atomized way of living really the most satisfying way to live, not to mention the most ecologically sustainable way to live? So I think those are some of the drivers, but then at the same time, some other sort of lenses I would look through would be that people who've been living in community like myself and yourself and people we know, what I find is that community is wonderful some of the time. And then if it's not practiced in a more conscious way, it can become really hellish. It can become really, really challenging and rife with conflict or with just unhealthy patterns. And so the, many of us who have lived in community realize, wow, I 
find myself wanting to be in a community that has a certain amount of maturity to it or a certain amount of consciousness to it or some kind of intentional path for development gives me a lot more hope that I'm going to enjoy community over the long term. And, and I'll just name one other sort of dimension of this, which is uh, there's a lot more attention in the last five, 10 years in particular on trauma and <clears throat> the understanding trauma is a much broader phenomenon than simply people who have gone through war or experienced physical or sexual abuse as children, which of course are significant and painful forms of shock trauma. We're understanding trauma in a much broader sense as well to be ways in which people from a young age have not received the sort of empathy, care, connection, belonging, attunement that really all beings or human beings especially thrive on. And with that understanding, we're recognizing what it takes to individually and collectively create a really healthy environment to raise children and to simply raise ourselves to have healthy relationships with with other people and so i think all of these factors awareness of trauma awareness of various social psychological ecological crises are all driving a longing for more meaningful robust mature ways of living together i'm curious if that resonates for you i think that resonates massively uh carl yeah i think it's and it's just to kind of trace i think what you said it's like so first of all there's a kind of there's a past and collective need where we see the challenges and the, the breakdowns of our society. I mean, we even say this life itself, you know, this, the second Renaissance moment where there's a breakdown of modernity or of, of the, the paradigm and the system we've been in economically, kind of psychologically, politically. And, you know, we hope of something kind of coming next, but people are looking for different ways to live. And one of those is to live it more in community or more collectively or more in neighborhoods or with connection, um, particularly if you're trying to pioneer or like live differently from the mainstream as it currently is. But then, as you say, there's a second point, which is, oh, wow, you know, that sounds great, but whether you've done it, whether you even haven't done it, but you've got all those kind of, kind of the bad stories of what flat sharing even could be like, or you have done it and you see that this kind of conscious part is crucial. And I, I think, you know, just to tell one anecdote that really struck me was that uh, I got through, through people, like, I didn't live there, but I got to see one, like a really famous kind of basically squatter collective in, in Barcelona that were founded by basically kind of an ecological uh, group, you know, people really doing stuff on climate. And I guess it was just incredible. I was meeting, you know, it's now about 15, 20 years on, I was meeting one of the founders and he's like, well... Um, it's, you know, we were all just kind of anarchists and, you know, we didn't really, we had, you know, we all thought it was about governance, which can do consensus and this, this incredible breakdowns in the community, no one, you know, now that nothing can get done, this all this falling out. And he's like, well, now actually, you know, what we got advised is we should all go and do therapy. And I thought this was a very, very thing that from a kind of, oh, we're just going to do this thing in this case, you know, fighting the, the bad aspects of kind of capitalism and consumer capitalism. And then we're just going to have this kind of decision-making system that will all make it work. And then this realization that inner development was absolutely crucial. And they'd reached this complete, um, you know, governance breakdown where no decisions had been made and, you know, people weren't speaking to each other and people were leaving. So I think this really classic, you know, it was a kind of the arc of the, perhaps the original vision that many of, no, not just others, but myself and gone through of this realization of the need for the conscious part of co-living. So I think that really resonates um, and why I think there's going to be a rise in this interest in, in this work. So I want to then come a little bit to the how. So um, what, you know, what have you seen? I mean, what have you seen over the years really working as examples and what obviously we can come to also I think we mentioned the last episode we can revisit you know some of the things we've even been kind of researching or experimenting but you know over you know the last few decades that you've been looking at this what what have you noticed um you know are like the, you know if someone said I, well I want to do conscious co-living you know we're, we're going to form a we're forming a community or, or even living together in you know, I don't know, not some kind of large flat share in a city and we want to do it more consciously. What would you, where would you start? Yeah. I love this question. It's one that I often explore with people. And so uh, first I, I, I want to name a caveat, which I wish I had said at the beginning of the call. And I, if I didn't say it in the last call, I want to say it every call, which is, you know, 
I'm passionate about this as you are. It's a subject that I love. I do think I have a certain amount of experience and I want to acknowledge that I am continually humbled. Like day after day, I am humbled and encounter my own limitations as a human being through the exploration of community. And particularly when I try to facilitate or be a leader or a catalyst in community, it's, it, it constantly reflects back my own learning edge and my own growth edge and my immature immaturity and and et cetera. So I think that's important to name and not just for me being honest about myself, but I think it's actually part of what we need in community is like the ability to, yes, on the one hand, acknowledge our experience and be real about it. But, and, and I don't think we need to be shy or, you know, but at the same time to also recognize that we are imperfect human beings and that most, if not all of us, have our own quote unquote trauma or, you know, immaturity that we're still learning to heal from or grow up into no matter what our age. And so having said that, um, I, when I think about what helps a community start and whether and function well, whether, as you say, it's a small little community project, like a few people sharing a house or a flat, all the way up to hundreds of people in an eco village or another kind of conscious community, one of the first things I would say is being really clear about our systems. And by systems, I mean the, the sets of agreements we have about how we're going to operate. And that includes what's our system for membership? What's our system for decision-making? What's our system for dealing with conflict? What's our system for dealing with finances? Like, in other words, having some really clear shared understandings of how we do things. And, and in particular, I would say the, the decision-making piece or governance is a really critical one because it's basically how do we exert power together? <laughs> like how do, and who makes decisions and how do they make decisions? Is it everybody who, who's living in the, in the community or the house or the neighborhood? Or is it the people who have lived there for a certain amount of time? Does it include people who are passing through for a couple months or not? You know, those are critical questions for so that governing question. And then rela uh, related to that, I think the other sort of system is really has to do with like purpose and membership. So really understanding like, what is the purpose of this community? Is it something we all agree upon? And then, so because that purpose will then help define how we create all these other systems like governance, like economics, like membership, like feedback, like conflict resolution, like our values and our purpose really will be the guiding light for the design of so many other features. Um, so we could go into more depth on all that, but those are some things that immediately come to mind for me. And what does this say would distinguish like a conscious but something more on the conscious collective, conscious community, conscious co-living end of things would, because one of the kind of points, I guess I would ask, or I reflect on is that you can have sometimes these kind of these written structures, but for example, you might say, oh, okay, you've got this conflict resolution procedure, but then, you know, when some actual significant conflict comes up, the really tough thing is not that there's a procedure written down, but do people kind of follow it and follow it in good faith, you know, follow it <laughs> with their heart. Mm -hmm. um, what I mean by that is that, you know, maybe you've got a classic conflict resolution procedure, might be, you know, okay, we could, the two, someone's got a conflict, the two people are going to first sit together and, you know, share maybe some particular practice they might use. And we, a life itself sometimes used beginning in you as one example and the many but from plum village tradition is a good reconciliation there are many you know then we might have a mediator and then we might you know and so on and what i've noticed is that for example it's great to have that procedure i mean first of all though sometimes people just don't when the actual breakdown happens they're kind of like no no this part you know there's no point there's no point talking to them because they're whatever yeah. but or even that you have it but people really struggle to really i guess you know i could include myself you know sometimes but you know like to hear to hear generously the other and in that case no matter how great the procedure is it doesn't go that well yeah. so what i guess i question i have to you is what do you think distinguishes you know m many kind of communities have those kind of rules about the government or other things but what makes them more conscious and what's this kind of you know 
a conscious kind of thing is it that there's what is it that's there there's, is it that there's stuff emphasized in the actual inner practices and how that works out in terms of these things or yeah can you say a bit about that yeah yeah i love i love what you're saying absolutely you could have the most amazing constitution or written out systems and that's not sufficient i do think it's very very helpful and a good place to start but it's not necessarily sufficient in and of itself. So it does point to another system that I think is quite important. And and these systems are, I agree, are not simply on paper, but need to be embodied. And I'll say a bit more, we can talk more about what, what we mean by embodiment, but <clears throat> having an onboarding system, and by that I mean, like, in other words, how do people come into a community or is there some kind of a learning path or orientation or previous amount of experience or learning that people are expected to do or have in order to step into community together? Or is there actually an ongoing practice or set of practices within the community? So either that kind of onboarding or ongoing practice, I think is really, really important to the embodiment of these various skills or systems. So for example, let's get to be concrete. It's like, because conflict is both something that I'm particularly interested in because I see I see it as actually one of the things that that really cripples, if not causes communities to fail again and again and again. You could have, as you said, a written out conflict resolution system, but that to have that fully be functional and embodied, people need to have some kind of background in, as you said, like, how do you listen empathically? How do you mediate conflict? How do people work with conflict in themselves? Just how do they take time to sort of take self-responsibility? That, that does take typically some kind of training or learning or developmental path. People might simply do it experientially by living in community, but in my experience, it can be very helpful to have some kind of explicit learning pathway in a community and ideally an ongoing practice. Nonviolent communication is, is one modality that gets talked about a lot in the intentional communities movement. I think, again, on paper, it could be applied in a way that could be deeply disconnecting. It could be, you know, people could use it in a very dogmatic or rigid way that could really disconnect. But if it's embodied in a really fluid, mature way, I think it can be a really profound way to take self-responsibility and be sharing power in how we both think and communicate. And so, again, it's not a cure-all, but if it's maturely embodied, I think it can be really profoundly helpful. And there are many other tools as well, whether it's meditation, whether it's therapeutic modalities, et cetera. So let's just spell this out for my myself and, uh, and maybe also listeners. Is, so I think so one major characteristic of what we'd call kind of conscious community or conscious co-living is that maybe parallel to the classic structural things that you would have, um, you know, a constitution, your written purpose, which, by the way, I, I emphasize even when written out, they are in some way embodied that, that in theory they've been created together and things like that. But the point is, often there are these kind of structural things people will have, you know, like that we done that we done. If you want to do an intentional community or flat share, but I think what we complement them with in conscious community is maybe explicit or implicit a set of an ecology of practices that are oriented to inner development that are crucial complement, even I would say foundation for those structures to actually work. So just to kind of work that through, what we're saying while you mentioned like NBC and other things is. Not only is NVC, you know, I mean, it might not be related, related to conflict resolution, but let, let's say, you know, you've got some conflict resolution procedure, things like NVC are both support um, that there might even be a form, but they also are helping the development, helping the practices that people have the, 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 the capacities to actually engage in conflict resolution, other things that will come up. To, for those things to work well. And so I'm just trying to say, we've kind of got like these, you know, crucially, crudely, we've kind of got these structural elements. And then we've got this ecology of practices of inner developmental or collective developmental practices that allow us to actually have the capacity to operate that. 
so I, I think that there's something just to kind of bring out when we came back to like, what is a what is a conscious community? It's something I think where those things are, you know, sometimes they are rising naturally. You know, as you said, all the people just are learning by being, you know, we rub up against each other in community and our rough edges get rubbed off just naturally. But just like maybe, and it's an analogy here, the more traditionally spiritual communities very much had an explicit, you, know, you meditate in this way, you have this set of ethics, you chant these things, whatever, but they have an explicit ecology of practices, of inner practices that are supporting the community's functioning. And so I think this is, this is something that, I mean, I kind of, there's, there's these really well-known examples of, I feel, this innovation being like, for example, famously of the Zeg, Zeg community has the Zeg Forum. There's actually kind of this innovation in an ecology of practice for resolving tensions or transfer, transforming conflict in the community. Could you talk more about those kind of examples of the things that you've seen arising in communities over the years or that you've learned that you think really work? You mentioned NBC, and obviously everyone will have their own opinion. This isn't that we have the right answers, but just from your what you've seen, your own past experiences and, and experiments and practice, what do you think are kind of like, if you're picking things for an ecology of practice for a community that you say, well, here's at least some kind of a good set that you could pick from. Yeah, I, I think the ones you've named already, I mean, the ones we've named, so Nonviolent Communication and Zeg Forum, I think is another that I really hear of quite a bit and have practiced quite a bit myself and, and really enjoy. Um, again, I think the difference in the quality of how it's practiced depends a lot on both facilitation and people's degree of experience and ability to to really hold that container well, but- um, you just, just for a second, for people maybe listening, just brief describe the Zeg, sure. Zeg Forum for people so they have a sense of what it is, because maybe people might know at least will be able to Google the NVC, but yeah, say a little bit about Zeg Forum as, as it's yeah. practiced. It's quite fascinating how it arose, <laughs> what it is. As a... Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm not an official facilitator of it. I've, I've had some training in facilitation of it, but I'll, I'll do my best to describe it. So. My understanding of it is we sit in a circle in community and we're we're creating, in a sense, a sacred container or a space within which people step into the center of the space. And that could be for a short piece, like a couple minutes, just moving around, expressing ourselves, or it could be for a longer piece of work for, let's say, five or more minutes. But people in entering the space, the idea is that like that that center of the circle is like the stage of, of the human drama, you know, and it's that, that we are simply playing roles in the human experience. And the recognition is that we're just in that role for this moment. It's not necessarily defining all of who we are, but we inhabit a role in order to really express it. And the facilitators, and it's typically a man and a woman who are helping facilitate the space, really try to support the person who enters into the circle to fully express whatever is true for them in that moment, whatever part they're playing in the human drama. And so that could be act, you know, physically acting out or amplifying their emotion that they're feeling. Maybe it's exhaustion and they're just like sluggishly, you know, collapsing into the center of the circle, or maybe they're in a rage and like really letting themselves feel and express that rage. Although one of the things that they in request that people do in the Zeg form is to not direct rage in a way that it is directed at an individual in the circle, but to really just like let that rage out, not in a, in a non-directive way, in a non-personalized way. And so the idea is to, to really support people to inhabit their expression of whatever's happening for them. And for everyone in the surrounding circle to be supporting that by seeing this as only one mask in a sense that people might be wearing in a particular moment. After somebody has done a larger piece of work, then there's also an invitation often of mirrors. And those mirrors could be other another person who just witnessed standing up, entering the circle and offering their reflection of what they just experienced, what they just heard. So they might act out some element of what they just experienced. And this then gives the person who just expressed a chance to see how what they expressed 
impacted other people or what other people took from what they expressed. And in my experience, it can be a really transformational practice because people are encouraged to express their emotions, they're encouraged to go deeper into whatever is true for them in the moment. And the whole community is encouraged to recognize that these are just roles that we take on temporarily and they're not all of who we are. So uh, it is a practice that I particularly value. Um, in terms of other practices, yeah, I, could please, name, yeah. I could name just a couple others that come to mind. Re restorative circles is one that gets, uh, which is a form of restorative justice, um, is, a, is an approach to transforming conflict, which originally was developed in Brazil by uh, the, the people living in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro and a, a fellow named uh, Dominic Barter from England who was living there uh, and is living there developed this approach to restorative justice called restorative circles, which is a, a very um, community-centric way of transforming conflict in a way that really encourages circular listening so that everybody in a in the circle gets heard and gets whatever is important to them reflected by others in the circle um and but it's more of a more of a dialogue process than what i was describing describing with a zeg form and it's really focused on a specific event or act where someone one or more people experience harm or negative impact and so it's intended to restore the disconnect that happened in that. So that's one that I've both worked with quite a bit and found practiced a number of communities. Therapeutically, I and, and others have found some awareness of, of practices like internal family systems therapy. There are many other forms of therapy as, that are related, but just a practice that, that helps us develop more compassion and awareness for the multiplicity or the complexity of our own personalities um, can be both helpful to individuals and when a community has a shared awareness of these kinds of internal family systems that people have also seems to support communities quite a lot. So those are just some examples. I mean, do you, just as an aside, maybe here, have you, I mean, obviously we've all witnessed kind of maybe breakdowns of community, but do you have examples where you've seen this kind of like in a way, even examples where people had kind of the structures, but they, the ecology of practice maybe was not there and or, or not for everyone and not just the ecology of practice, but to be, I think it's crucial to emphasize the point of the practices, it allows us as participants in our communities to be evolving and to keep discovering, you know, we see our edges, but I kind of think it's important maybe for listeners uh, and, and ourselves to be reflecting why it's so crucial, because at least for myself, you know, I've being, we've kind of got all these rules, you know, we've got not rules, but, you know, like we're going to do this, you know, I just been like, wow, it just didn't, <laughs> didn't work out the way I thought it was going to work out. And, and you know, those those breakdowns are so costly. You know, as you said, the biggest kind of killer of community is conflict, unresolved conflict, we're either repressed or expressed, but without uh, not unconstructive conflict. Because I want to come to in a moment, you know, obviously conflict is always going to be there. It can be incredibly constructive. It's not a problem in itself, but unresolved. Yes, yeah, so can you? I mean, maybe obviously not if you're like anything, just examples to really illustrate for us, like what how, how it can go not so well despite having the rules and regulations or the even the kind of agreements in yeah. place. Yeah, and I think that distinction between agreements versus rules is really quite important in the sense that you know, even just the language of rules in many cases can, for a lot of people, lead to a sense of rebellion or pushing up against, whereas when people are really invited into a participatory experience of agreeing to something, that often is experienced quite differently by people. So I think that's an important distinction. But absolutely, and I, again, I want to be really clear that I've been a part of and I've co-created many communities over the years, whether short-term or long-term, and I've contributed to, in some cases, wonderful community experiences, and I've contributed to sometimes painful and not so healthy community experiences. Um, and fortunately, I think I've learned quite a bit from, from both. And the, the things that I see happening 
that really I experience as leading to maybe more breakdowns. And as you say, I agree, I don't see conflict as a problem, but there are more destructive or toxic or unhealthy forms of conflict. So when I've seen conflict really causing more damage or sort of tearing apart the fibers of a healthy community, usually in my experiences, and of course, there's many lenses through which we could look at this, but I mean, often in my view, it could be diagnosed as being under-resourced. In other words, that there is not enough support in the system, not enough support in the community for people to be able to show up as their best selves or to be able to show up and navigate conflict successfully. Of course, as we've already said, that could have to do with the amount of training or experience or consciousness that an individual has. But even if somebody has training and a certain amount of consciousness, if they're under stress or either the individual or if the collective is under stress, let's say they're trying to take on far too much or they're they're in a conflict zone, for example, or but in some cases, maybe a conflict zone would actually lead them to come together in a certain way. But um, but if they're under resourced to emotionally to be dealing with that conflict, that's where I see things falling apart more. And so I think it's a really important consideration to look at how much are we prioritizing, making sure that we have enough resource to deal with the kinds of challenges we're dealing with, whether it's conflict, whether it's trying to grow food, et cetera, you know, knowing like given the constraints that we have, given the people who are here, given what we're trying to accomplish and et cetera, do we have enough time, energy, emotional resource to tackle these challenges together? I think is a really big question and or do we need to reprioritize or do we need to change the makeup of who's in the community in order to be able to succeed at whatever purpose or purposes we've set forth for ourselves so is there any just to ask i mean can you share one example maybe not necessarily of yourself personally that you've known of where you know, that showed up, like, where maybe there was just ended up not being enough resourcing. I think just make it, con- like, even, you know, obviously it's anonymous examples, but what people can learn from, because I think I also want to explain, I think there's, you know, I even gave a talk recently about Oroville, um, which, you know, is one, I don't know, maybe people have heard of it not, but one of the most famous kind of maybe intentional, I would even say, like, kind of transformational communities and with kind of very high ambitions about the integration of the spiritual and the material and like the evolution of human consciousness uh founded it you know obviously well by not by Sri Aurobindo directly but by his his kind of key collaborator the mother um and you know that went through this incredible you know this is this community based on Sri Aurobindo's work this incredible like I guess really spiritual I was a genius, like this kind of incredible figure of the 20th century, uh, integrating East and West, this whole view of, you know, human conscious evolution. And there's this incredible civil war that takes place basically within Oroville at the big, and it's kind of soon after its founding um, that, uh, you know, for me was, you know, really amazing, kind of, I guess, for me, I didn't see it as, ne- I mean, I, you know, I wish for them that it hadn't happened that way, but I also see it as like, wow, A, Oroville still exists, but also maybe these are things we have to do. And in their case, no one was killed, you know, <laughs> maybe we didn't talk to each other for for some time, but uh, some of the people, but it was like really, um, you know, this is sometimes maybe what we need to go through in our maturity, but so I'm not kind of trying to be crazy, but like in sharing, what do you have an example of what, having seen this example of the under resourcing in, in in some sense, or you could say, you know, if a community you saw that had difficulties in this way? Yeah, sure. Let me just name a couple examples, and I think I can do so relatively and honestly. Or they they actually the what I'll describe I've seen in more than one community. In fact, yeah. so <clears throat> one would be an example of community where, for example, certain dynamics related to race or gender are so 
in race, gender, age were so intensely polarizing to the community that the community just didn't have the, and again, I think it could be any number of resources. It could be time, it could be energy, it could be skill, it could be competency, it could be systems. But I think in some ways, there was some shortage in perhaps multiple areas that made dealing with the explosive nature of th these identity topics of race, gender, age, so upsetting to people involved on both sides of the conflict that, that there was basically people stopping talking to each other in the community for years. And so, in other words, like schisms or breaks in the community where people are simply living alongside each other, but but not engaging with other members of the community. And I've seen this happen in multiple, multiple communities. And I don't see this as, as necessarily like a shortcoming of the individuals or even a shortcoming of the community or of intentional communities in general or conscious communities in general. But I think it's reflective of the larger society we live in. I mean, these issues of race and, and gender, for example, patriarchy and white supremacy is being are both being named and talked about quite regularly now in the wider society. These are huge cultural forces that are politically causing huge rifts. And particularly in the United States, I, I'm more aware of that context because I've lived there and worked in a number of communities there that political con cultural conflict in the wider society is showing up in intentional communities and in and and in conscious communities as well and in in those cases it can be more than the community is resourced to handle and again i wouldn't say resourced in any one particular resource but in a number of these dimensions i mentioned so that would be one example and i i can name another but i'll pause for a moment if there's anything you want to say or i could continue so just to get congruent one of those, so what let's pick, I don't know, what would be an example of an actual conflict that are like sure. what what was the actual issue that would show up that showed up in the community sure. over race or gender? Yeah. And sure. what would be the kind of positions that would come? Because I want to I want to spell that out and then maybe briefly talk about maybe any examples where that has been successfully sure. that conflict's been. But to start out with, it's just good to have a really concrete example of like what, what was the the yeah. question of how one should address, yeah. Sure. I mean, I'll I'll be as specific as I feel comfortable being, given that I want to yeah. keep it anonymous. Yeah. Again, and it's because it's something I've seen in multiple communities, yeah. not simply one. But so let's say in a community, you have two people have an interaction. Maybe one person is of a particular ethnic background. Another person is of a different ethnic background. And in that exchange, and it's usually not one exchange, but I'm just saying there is at least one and usually multiple exchanges of some similar kind where a person of, of one ethnic group says a particular thing, which this other person of a different ethnicity experiences as deeply upsetting, offensive, problematic, disconnecting, etc. And whether they in that moment or at some point express their upset about it and the way that the other person responds to that upset doesn't lead to more connection. They actually respond by trying to justify or explain or say that wasn't my intention or you know, you're being too sensitive or there's many possible responses that don't build more connection. And so with that, the disconnect between those two individuals as I said, it's usually not one event. It's then that maybe happens, maybe nothing more happens. But then another in incident, maybe with one of those people happens again, something along similar lines until something really explosive happens where one or more individual says, I can't take it anymore. You you are being too sensitive or too insensitive or whatever, and accusations begin to escalate, usually in both directions, to a point where one or more people are no longer willing to engage 
with other people in the community. So that's as specific as I feel comfortable. Yeah, going. No, no. But, I, but that's, again, a, a pattern which I've seen many times. What would you say, then, is what's a great, where does the conscious co-living parts come in? It's like the capacities, both of the parties and the surrounding to help resolve that conflict in a constructive way. Yeah. And, and what is that what will trans, transcend or transform that conflict? What kind of, what have you ever seen that happen? And what does that look like? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so the, it's going back to things we've we've said already in this conversation, but the combination of having some clear practices and or, and I would say agreements and practices for how do we deal with these moments because they will arise. So having those mutually understood so that there's shared understanding of the of the whole community is tremendously helpful. And having people not just understand those things intellectually, but having a certain amount of embodiment or practice with how do we slow down when conflict begins to arise? How do we slow down and take perhaps self-responsibility by noticing, wow, I'm getting agitated, I'm getting upset, I'm getting frustrated, I'm getting angry, you know, realizing my voice is raising, I'm speaking faster, my fists are clenching, my my chest is constricting. <sighs> Noticing those things, realizing that we can pause, slow down, realize not just realizing it but doing it <laughs> you know easier said than done i'm i've been training and practicing even teaching this for years and i'm not always practicing it fortunately i am able to practice it in a lot of cases and i'm able to support other people even more effectively than i can support myself in it but having that capacity individually and having it as a shared a practice and agreement. And as and something I just actually said as a bit of an aside is quite significant that it's not just about the two individuals who might most immediately be in conflict. It's not just their capacity and awareness and skill, but it's actually the others around them who are actually going to be the more resourced people in that moment. So in other words, third parties, somebody who might be able to step in to informally or formally help slow the conversation down, help offer empathy to both people, help people find a way to hear each other. Those kinds of capacities are also really, really essential. So those are some of the things that I think can make a critical, critical difference. And of course, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, I really, really reflect, and it is an aside, I mean, you don't want to go into it, so I think there are some kind of foundational aspects also of conscious communities. What I mean is some kind of commitment. So, for example, um, you know, maybe I speak for myself, you know, I was brought up, you know, my, my I guess my, my father was, you know, very, really lovely man, but very man, very based in reason and about like what he was a lawyer, you know, it's like what was right, you know, like establishing um, that. And I notice even in our society today, and I'm just mentioning, I guess, is that there's a lot of emphasis on like, well, who's right, you know? And in some ways, I also think there's some foundational commitments in place in what you're saying in French communities, kind of like a commitment maybe to kind of a certain level of compassion. It doesn't mean tolerating what that is, which is unacceptable. And we could, could easily imagine things right now but you know i i don't want to go off into that topic but you know obviously some very charged situation you know israel and gaza right now or you know other situations and i picked that one particularly because it, it's one in which one can at least imagine good faith people on sometimes either side of it um but I, but what one notices and i think this is crucial is that we often exist in the world now where it's like one side or the other is beyond the pale you know you're either you're either an anti-Semitic or you're condoning genocide. I'm picking a silly example. I mean, I don't want to, but you know, it it's an incredibly charged field. And this commitment to somehow compassion, you know, and even in the most extreme case, I mean, I know another example is obviously Ukraine, where, you know, 
how can we, you know, you might, some people might say, well, how can we have any empathy or something with Vladimir Putin or whoever it is? I don't know what people's thoughts are. But I think there's some kind of these, these kind of core commitments also of this. There's a kind of certain humility and this kind of really subtle lines that start, I think, that are to walk, which are deep in most kind of wisdom traditions. So, you know, how, how do you have deep compassion, but without tolerating or accepting? It doesn't mean condoning something that's kind of un, somehow um, not not right. You know, it doesn't mean condoning cruelty or standing by while some unacceptable thing happens. Absolutely. But there's a, there's something kind of deep in having kind of a compassion understanding um that that's there in a in a world at the moment where there's often funny enough um incredible righteousness and i i've seen it in myself you know in, in my life um and then you know the anger that comes with righteousness which is always in i was speaking again only for myself maybe but i always see comes back to some pain or hurt in me that almost always is some the the real reactivity in myself is always related to some kind of wound that i've not fully healed you know being on the playground as a kid and being you know pushed around or that you know whatever it is you know sometimes the trivial you know um you know you know my sister got more pocket money than me or something whatever it is i don't know you know it could be the really i got you know whether it's really strong or really seemingly minor and i think that 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 there, there's some kind of underlying commitments that they're there that i notice um you know which which are very you know very hard to maintain i'm always i'm always struck to end on this point which is the story you know even the buddha you know this is a story i think where he goes to one you know one of his sanghas you know he's traveling around and this has been this fighting between the precepts master and someone else over you know someone of one one of the monks claims that the other monk kind of offended him by doing something disrespectful the other monk said i didn't do it and like the whole community has become riven between these two factions. And, you know, the Buddha even goes and like pleads before the assembly, like, please, brothers, you know, and they're like, go away, but it's so, this isn't any of your business. <laughs> he goes off to the forest and is like, okay, I'm going to practice here. <laughs> like, so I, I, you know, but I think that, that we are growing as a human. I hope, I have faith in some way that we, while there are many ups and downs, that there's there's kind of hope in our evolution and the human condition, and that yeah. part of it is this, which is this ability to transcend even the most uh, deep conflicts. Um, so I kind of want to come from that point, which is can I can I just yeah, say, can something, say something on that? Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and it resonates deeply for me, and so. You know, we've named nonviolent communication, and I've mentioned restorative circles, and these those are two modalities which are very, very much rooted in this compassionate understanding of human motivation. And again, what I think is critical is that it also necessitates, and both of those traditions speak of the importance of accountability. So like, it doesn't mean there aren't healthy boundaries and consequences and accountability for actions. I do think that it's really important that we complement compassion, as you said, with healthy accountability, and we make sure that we keep people safe. And but they can coexist, this kind of radical empathy and compassion can coexist with really healthy uh, structures and making sure that we don't allow people to continue to behave in ways that that harm others. So, absolutely, and and having that as as a central tenet, and as well as this understanding that so much of conflict is actually driven by blame based thinking or right wrong thinking, which it's not as though there isn't important information underneath those beliefs of right and wrong and but but actually simply thinking in terms of right wrong and good and bad actually can create or feed so much conflict whereas when we understand what's motivating people and when we understand basic human needs we can actually find much more healing ways to resolve conflict instead of making one person right and the other person wrong as you were saying like instead of like righteousness we can seek to actually heal and care for everybody's needs and i think again like having a trauma informed view of conflict i think is something that is still in its evolution right now and i'm really excited to be hopefully contributing to is how can we actually have a justice system whether it's in a community or in a society 
that actually recognizes what it takes to heal trauma rather than simply believing that punishment is going to correct people's behavior, which it doesn't seem to do at all. Like we see it again and again in that punitive justice systems that use punishment rather than accountability actually lead to recidivism, like repeated offense. Whereas when we have a, a justice system and a prison system that tries to heal people and helps them work through their, their pain, their trauma, and their unhealthy patterns, we see people not repeating the, the painful behaviors in nearly the same uh, degree as we would with punishment. So I, I agree completely that I think that is central to a conscious community setting is that we look at conflict from this sort of multi-perspectival or in other words, from multiple perspectives, as well as like seeing the humanity even in really painful behaviors. Again, not to condone it, but to help transform it and to help us collectively heal together, even while we have healthy boundaries. So yeah, I just, I want to second what you're saying and, and see this as, to me, really central to what we're doing in community. So I want to come back now to a couple of like more specific questions, if that's okay. Sure. So one of which was like the, the kind of spectrum between, let's say, more casual to more um, maybe disciplined ecologies or practices in the community. So what, to kind of come out to that, what, by kind of strict and kind of casual, what would we mean in terms of an ecology of practice? Can you give an example of quite a strict one? I don't know, like Aikido, or I, I don't know, or monastic, you know, and what would be a more casual ecology of practice? And just have a sense of people to have this idea of yeah. a spectrum. Yeah, I mean, the most immediate examples that come to mind for me is like at the most more strict end of the spectrum would be a monastery, it would be, you know, whether it's a Christian monastery, whether it's a Buddhist monastery, but but where there's a very clear, perhaps even required schedule of the prayer or meditation, people all eating together, people working together for the sake of the community. Like in, in some of these communities, the, the far end of the spectrum would be, in a sense, your whole day is scheduled out and most of the day is in service to the whole or in shared practice with other people. And so that, and, and I'd say often, not always, but often that goes along with also a clear leadership hierarchy of some kind where there's, there's either an individual or a group of individuals who are more senior, who are directing or dictating that schedule and as well as the decisions and the functioning of the community. So I'd say that would be a more strict end of the spectrum of an ecology of practice. And then the, the far end of the other end of the spectrum would, if we're calling it a conscious community, would be perhaps a, you know, a group of people who are inspired by things like reinventing organizations or um, some integral theory or you know who want to live together consciously but perhaps put set a high premium on individual choice self organization collective leadership etc where perhaps nothing is required or very minimal amounts of things are are required perhaps simply there's a weekly meeting uh and, and maybe even that is not required but you know, I, I don't know that i've experienced I'm trying to think the furthest I've experienced at that end of the spectrum and probably the furthest, if I would call it a conscious community, would be there's some kind of meeting that that happens on a regular basis and people try to have meals together. But but really, there might be a lot of diversity beyond that in terms of what people do with their time and if they do anything together. I mean, that's something I don't want to explore too much here uh, because it could come for another episode, but I've often won, at least the hypothesis I had quite early on, you know, the beginning of life itself about eight, nine years ago was that in terms of stability or, or feasibility, there's sort of a U shape. Like it's mm -hmm. quite easy to be very casual. I mean, in some ways, I wouldn't say they always sustain as a community, but you know, people come and go. But you know, <clears throat> you know, flat shares happen if you like, uh, you know, and that, but at the other end, we also have very good examples that pretty like strict ecologies of practice communities have survive for a long time um but that 
it's kind of difficult to maybe be somewhere in, you know in in the, in the in the middle and i don't know i mean it's something i'd like to we could talk about a bit more but i guess is to say for me i mean i also would say that if, to really be a conscious community with very loose practices people have to have a lot of self discipline the classic reason you have this whole schedule is, is as we all know it's hard to go to the gym all the time it's hard to meditate on your own regularly or do all those inner both personal, but maybe collective practices that make a community function. You know, in a way, you have to be very enlightened to have a very limited ecology uh, of, of practice, or at least a shared ecology of practice. I mean, would just any comment on that idea that there's like, it's difficult, you know, it's obviously, it's quite easy to not have too much agreed. We all live in quite individualistic setups, but you know, I've certainly seen co-living environments, quite a few like that, which, which clearly function, but where I lost you for a while. Let me just reiterate that in case I had a, a breakout, which is to say, I don't know how much you've got, but there's this kind of spectrum of very casual to very strict. You know, is it possible to coexist in the middle? You know, or do you have to move more towards the strict or more towards the loose? You know, where can people exist on this spectrum? <clears throat> I think it's a it, it's an interesting question that I think is difficult to answer without getting a lot more precise about what we mean by conscious community, because, you know, the way we're talking about it, we're talking about it in a very broad sense. And so it really would depend for me on where we're drawing the line, like what actually makes a community conscious enough, you know, or is it, is it simply a continuum? Yeah. Because I mean, I'll use an example that is one of the communities I've lived in for a number of years is, is the Findhorn community in Scotland, which is which many people know of as a community that's been around since the 1960s. And interestingly, is identifies its broader community as an eco-village, but really was, by most people's understanding, you know, it was founded as a spiritual community. Or certainly spiritual inquiry has been a really central aspect of the community. And what I think is interesting there is that there is historically there had been in the earlier stages of the community a requirement to meditate every day and in fact in the in the earlier days a decade or decades of the community one of the founding members they would basically send people or they would go wake people up if they weren't at morning meditation and so in that sense it was at a time quite uh, structured um and with with very specific expectations but by the time i lived there which is in the last uh really i guess 20 years um really there there was no one central community like the community had had sprouted into a number of different dimensions which really couldn't be defined as one intentional community. I would certainly define it, though, as a conscious community. There were really principles by which the community as a whole aspired to live. Many, many people meditated, but but meditation wasn't required. In fact, really, depending on which aspect of the community you were a part of, you weren't required necessarily to do anything to fit within the wider community. Um, so, and yet, and there, and there was not one belief system. I mean, some people were very much into some kind of Christianity or some people were practicing Buddhism or people were atheistic or agnostic. And, and yet that community functioned and continues to function, I think, beautifully and imperfectly, like many communities, in a, in a very pluralistic kind of way. So... I, I'm I'm cautious about many making any kind of like absolute statement about how you know how structured a community is and how conscious it is and how durable or or successful it is. Yes, no, I mean very, very good. I mean, I would. I mean, there is this paper of John Sosa's various, which is yeah. I've come back to. I mean, it's kind of interesting what you say is at least at the beginning it had quite a strong ecology of practice that was quite coherent and that over time you might say it's almost become quite diverse i mean one question i think we're coming towards our, our uh, end for today but it's to say you were saying one thing i'd like to also talk a little bit about is the spectrum of or degree of shared leadership you know there's kind of communities or conscious kind of communities or collectives where you have like individual leadership and there might be a leadership team 
or to even like fully kind of like maybe self-organizing or self-management. Do you want to, could you say a little bit about that or your thoughts about mm -hmm. that reflections? Yeah, I, I think it's something that is really important for communities to be consciously grappling with or reflecting on together because while I myself have been a part of hosting and facilitating what I would call as like learning spaces, and sometimes we've even called them like learning communities for a certain period of time where myself or a, a group of us are acting more as facilitators or trainers or leaders of that community for a certain period of time. While I see the purpose of that, I find myself really cautious about long-term communities where there's too much concentration of authority or power because what power does over time in, in a community. And so like that's why in my own personal exploration of community, I really am trying more and more to, to actually separate learning spaces or training spaces from when we're all living together in community. Because if you have somebody who is really a strong leader or teacher in one domain in a training, and then you're living alongside them, they continue to inhabit that teacher role or that leader role ongoingly in a community, you, you have the potential to have the guru phenomenon or the the what I think can easily become unhealthy, not only the concentration of power, but with that concentration of power, I think we, when we're living together over time, people in those leadership positions, unless there's a, conscious way that the community holds it differently, they're going to tend to mask or avoid revealing their less mature aspects yeah, because they yes. need to keep staying in authority. They need to keep staying in that sort of position of being the one in control and they don't they don't have to deal with their stuff or they can't deal with their stuff because because they're what I mean by stuff, they can't, healthily work through or get support for their own wholeness and healing and ongoing evolution. And so even though many traditions of spirituality and religion have this pattern of conscious communities, which have these kinds of leaders, I believe that there's a danger there that we need to look out for. I think that it can be valuable perhaps to have people with more experience with a certain degree of authority within a system, but I think it's really important that that circle you know, is able to shift and evolve and bring in new members and there can be checks and balances and feedback and that we make sure that power is shared out pretty broadly within those communities because otherwise the unconsciousness and unhealthy aspects of whoever's in leadership will become the shadow or become the the weak point of the community as a whole and i say that having seen that in myself as well when i have been in too much authority within a, a community over a long period of time and I'm not able to get my emotional support because I'm continually seeing myself as needing to be the authority. I just, I see the limitations for the community as a whole. So that's uh, something we could explore a lot more, but I think is not just unique to me, but is something I see again and again and again in communities. So I am curious how that, how, how you relate to that. No, it's a really great point. I mean, I, I want to emphasize, I think, as you said, there's a there's a kind of like um there's this there's this huge issue that when you have to be in a position of authority, I think it's particularly also whether we think of it in spiritual religious communities or even today, though, like the kind of often there's another whether it's 
there's still the kind of the authority of the paradigm. There's this idea that you're supposed to be kind of flawless. There's no space to express your own shadow. So it does a disservice to, I think, the leaders. And then as you say, that, that shadow gets played out. I mean, um, you know, we, you, know, you can point to, to many, many examples, but I think the other thing I want to emphasize, I think it also robs, um, I don't want to say it robs, I think that it, then the other community members or other members who have less power, it also kind of removes sovereignty from them. Like, but I also want to say that they don't take responsibility. I think what's very subtle in this, and I have to say, I've seen it. I mean, maybe some of it's myself. I mean, is there's a huge desire in us sometimes to surrender our responsibility as human beings. You know, include my. You know, I want to. You know, I want this to be decided for me by somebody else. And I think that that's the that's the subtlety of this is that often you know we're wanting to give up. You know, I don't know. I mean, to bring it to you know, I recently watched the uh, second episode of June, uh, which you may not, but I, but I think very much more than the books really pulls out this aspect of the desire to have the Messiah, to have to have someone that we then surrender our responsibility and will to, and the the ambiguity of that figure. Um, and I think I've even noticed just to say for myself sometimes. Um, you know, I won't say who, but I was like, in a way, I was very impressed by like there was a Zen master was, who kind of in a way was very authentic of like, wow, I'm st still dealing with, you know, the shadows, come, you know, or like I'm, you know, I, you know, I, I've, you know, I've received Dharma transmission, but I'm still dealing with stuff. I was I expecting him to be kind of totally on non-reactive? Everything's always great in his life, you know, and I was almost, I was, I noticed myself, I was almost disappointed that he was acknowledging that like, no, it wasn't, you know, while he had all this wisdom, you know, no, he's still... There was still reactivity he was dealing with, or still suffering that would come up for him, and I think that there's this kind of tendency to seek kind of perfection, or even like try, like behold our dreams. And I think that this is a very complicated thing. And it's a great part of I think the maturity of a community. And I think it to add, it is a dance because the other side of it at the moment is like that also to myself is what I call the equality complex. Right. There won't be any leaders. You know, I remember I first went to Plum Village. I was like, why is Thich Nhat Hanh giving the Dharma talk? You know, why, why, you know, why is he giving the Dharma talk every, every day? You know, why isn't it someone else? Um, and I think there's some dance in our ability. And I think they're actually related, which is our ability to be set, to not, to not, to, to know our own agency. And if you like that term sovereignty, I don't know, but you know, it, when I'm safe in that, I'm able to delegate and be like, okay, this person knows better about this thing right now. We're going to listen yeah. to them or they're going to yeah. be in charge. But, you know, like, but also has the ability to not delegate it too much. And I think yeah. that there's this, we're in a moment sometimes where we want to tear down all the leaders. Like, why, you know, like the way we talk about our politicians, why would they be any good when the way we listen to them is like, they're X, Y, Z. But the converse is we've had, you know, you know, how do we not, as we say, give it away, you know, and we see both of those uh, play, I think, in many political elections or political situations. I know that's a very um, less spiritual one, but I think it's this kind of aspect. So I think for me, just a real reflection, it was very powerful, your share for me there, is that this, this is something about the maturity of community in general. Um, and and a, another big part, which is the kind of, the degree of consciousness of each of us as participants actually creates the circumstance of whoever is whoever's is leading in any given thing. You know, maybe it's just today who's running the cooking, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, to each one. Um, so I think this is very, a very, very rich point. And I mean, again, I mean, I, I'm always struck. I mean, I'm a, I come from a Zen Buddhist end. It's like, I remember like, you know, Thich Nhat begins, his, I think the heart of the Buddhist teacher is saying the Buddha is a man, you know, he was a man like any others. And yet, obviously, even in Buddhism, where that's sort of been a core teaching, often we have like, oh, he becomes this, or, you know, the Zen master is, is kind of a godlike figure or Zen mistress, you know, and this kind of, this aspect of it. And so I think that there's this deep, this is something very deep in human condition and something that as we gradually transform i think opens up a space for whole new kinds of leadership uh power sharing and organization but really requires some transformation a continuing transformation ourselves yeah so yeah
I think it's very, uh, I think on that note, it's great. I mean, if any last comments to you, it's a great note to end on, which is that I think is one of the big parts of the future of community is like who, you know, the, the nature of leadership. Yeah, beautiful. I resonate so much with what you're saying, which again is it's it's either the paradox or how do we integrate both? Yes, there's there's a healthy place for natural authority and leadership. And we should recognize it's really helpful to have elders and to have people who are recognized with more experience. And if we're going to be living together in a, in communities ongoingly where we're really sharing our lives and our worlds, it does I think support us tremendously to have a breadth of like encouraging and supporting people into various degrees of leadership so that we don't concentrate power in unhealthy ways. Cause as you say, it's not healthy for ever, anyone. Yeah. Thank exactly. you so much. Yeah. Love, love, yeah. love all that you're sharing. Well, with that, we'll bring to the end of today's session and uh, we look forward to you to joining us our next one. Thank you everyone.